Hello everybody, welcome to More Chains As Needed, where, because I love horror, thrillers and suspense, I am going to talk, rant, rave about, review and recommend movies, TV series and books in those genres for you guys as I draw. I decided to start 2022 with some classic movies that some people may think that have some problematic legacy. And I am not talking about the usual way in which old movies age poorly, no. This genre of movies is problematic from the get-go, and it has been the cause of a lot of arguments for and against it, literally the moment every new movie that can be considered a part of it is announced. In fact, I know people who will refuse to see a movie within the genre because of the real-life consequence some of these movies have even if the argument about if movies and TV shows can affect real life is still, well, out with the jurors. This time I am talking about the animal attack movies. Not the frankly distasteful videos of real animals attacking real people that get recollected either on YouTube or on shows that tend to forget that animals by nature do not go attacking people as long as people don't go into their habitats. But the horror movies in which, instead of a fantastic monster, we get a pretty normal animal that suddenly goes rabid, insane, or just decides to attack the nervy humans because the script says that we are very tasty. This specific genre is quite old, and we've had pretty much every animal imaginable as a attacker of civilization. From spiders, normal sized and giant, which I frankly won't be discussing as I am terribly arachnophobic, to dogs, from bees to piranhas, and from monkeys to bunnies. Sometimes the animals attacking are victims of a human scientist getting into their genes, sometimes radiation is the actual evil, and pretty much every single time we will have someone trying to insist that there's absolutely nothing to worry about even as the body count increases. It was a staple of horror B-movies back in the 50s and the 60s, but I want to talk first and foremost of the one movie that not only brought the animal attack to the A tier of movies, it also created the summer blockbuster. I am, of course, talking about Jaws. And while Jaws was filmed and premiered way back in the last century, Here's your spoiler warning in case you haven't seen this classic film and still want to watch it unspoiled. Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg and released in 1975, is based on the now forgotten but then bestseller of the same name by Peter Benchley. Published in 1974 and a very curious case of a commissioned novel because it wasn't written because Benchley thought a lot about shark attacks, even if he had written articles about shark hunter Frank Mundus but because Doubleday wanted a novel in 1971 and Shark sounded like a good subject for a horror book. Many think it was a bestseller because of Doubleday's aggressive marketing, since most critics didn't like either the prose or the characters that Benchley wrote. Steven Spielberg was quoted saying that while reading the book, he, more often than not, found himself siding with the shark, which led him to take some huge liberties with the plot in order to make the characters people whom he didn't want to fit to the fishes after 10 minutes of hearing them talk. Apparently that feeling was quite shared by the critics of the novel, which made it easier for the movie to completely shadow the original, mostly by literally ignoring every single subplot that the book presented and just focusing on the shark, which, ironically, was almost never seen on screen. So, what is just the movie about? And yes, this is going to be the most basic synopsis and I will try to go on about without, you know, spoiling a classic movie that was released almost 60 years ago. The beach town of Amity Island has a problem. The body of a young woman was discovered at the shore and it seems pretty obvious that she was attacked by a shark. So, the newly arrived police chief Martin Brody, played magnificently by Roy Snyder, decides to close the beaches for everyone's safety and call a shark specialist, a very young Richard Dreyfus. Unfortunately, before the specialist arrives, the mayor, Larry Bound, played by Maureen Hamilton, convinces Brody to undo that decision by first making the coroner change the cause of death to boat accident, and later pointing out that the town can survive without tourists, and tourists only come because of the beaches. 
Brody is later haunted by this choice as, well, the same shark kills a young boy in front of everyone in the beach. After a small shark is caught, but another attack proves it was not the man killer, the mayor finally agrees to hire a man named Quint, Robert Shaw, to make sure the danger is really over. Oh, also, the movie has one of the most memorable scores of all horror movie history, courtesy of Hollywood legend John Williams. No other two notes can cause as much fear as Dun 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 The whole story of Horus Yells was filmed, by the way, is an epic on its own right. From Spielberg not wanting to do the movie and hating pretty much the first two halves of the book, to Bensley admitting he couldn't give the characters any depth for the screen, and a writer's strike looming on the horizon, to the shark animatronic breaking every time a seagull farted on the opposite side of the world, all the problems that a film production could have ended up happening to the Joss crew. The main roles of Brody and Queen, the shark hunter, Schneider and Shaw respectively, were not cast until about nine days before the filming started, and Shaw in particular hated the book, while Dreyfus hadn't even read it at Spielberg's request, given how the role of biologist Hooper was widely different in the film. At some point, the producers, with such imagination that would have made Bialystok and Bloom proud, wanted to train a real-life great white shark for filming, something that I am sure caused more than one film insurance agent to faint. I mean it. The documentary about how Jaws was filmed, it's an amazing movie on its own. I mean, they even had the audacity to be the very first movie to be filmed on the open ocean, which of course led to even more troubles. To be fair, it is actually surprising that only one real shark ended up entangled accidentally in the whole thing. Well, at least during filming. First things first. Sharks do not generally go around attacking people. This is important to note because, well, Joss managed to get a certain image of the big guys in the public's mind. Yes, there have been recorded cases of shark attacks, mostly to surfers, and at least four cases of multiple victims to one attack, two of which are referenced in the movie. The Jersey Shore attacks of 1916, which left for dead, and the USA's Indianapolis crew in 1945. Although, to be fair, the Indianapolis crew faced a lot of other problems besides the shark, given that it sank after being torpedoed by the Japanese during World War II. But in general, sharks do not like how humans taste, and most of the unprovoked attacks are due to mistaken identity, because the shark believes the human in question is a seal, a fish, or a turtle. Or curiosity, because sharks need to bite things to figure out what the hell the thing is. Unfortunately, due to the size and number of teeth a shark has, said bites tend to be fatal even if the shark is not interested in eating the human. So yeah, a shark going out of its ways to go and eat not one, but about five human beings? Very rare to the point of complete fiction. I am not counting the poor dog because A, the movie doesn't focus on the poor dog, and B, well, I have no idea how much sharks like to eat dogs given that they don't meet that often. That said, all of this is relatively new information for us. In 1975, sharks were a thing to be feared. Evil killing machines, as Hooper, or resident marine biologist, says, and, well... There are more than a hundred movies on IMBD that are about evil sharks eating people, from the slightly realistic open water to, well, let's just say that Sharknado is not the most ridiculous scenario that these movies can show. And while Jaws wasn't the first evil shark movie, that honor goes to Killer Shark from 1950, it certainly was the one who captured everyone's imagination and left a permanent mark in pop culture and environmental activism from the moment it premiered. There is a good reason for this, and it's not just that it won three Oscars, Best Music, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Film Editing, all of them very well deserved, 
or that it was the first summer blockbuster with 67 million people watching it on theaters in a time when summer was not famous for good movies. It was the time when people forewent going to the movies to go to the beaches. But because Joss had so many troubles during production, the premiere date was moved from December, the original blockbuster month, to the summer where flops were left to die, and the rest is history. It didn't even take an advantage of the fact that the original was a bestseller, as the script took many, many liberties with the story, as I keep saying, and pretty much only kept the shark and most of the victims by deleting every human subplot that the novel had, which had the unexpected consequence of making it a disaster movie that didn't include the marriage therapy subplot that every other disaster movie seems to have. I mean it. There was not only a plot in which Brody's wife was unfaithful to him to, with Hooper that went absolutely nowhere in the novel, the mafia was also involved. There were land sharks besides sharks. But the real reason why Joss became such a classic is that every single person in the cast and crew brought their A-game to a movie that the producer saw as B at best and made it a timeless thriller masterpiece. One of the lasting effects that Joss reportedly had was that people became scared of the water in the same way that some people started distrusting showers thanks to Psycho, which I will talk about in a different time. While there have been a lot of discussion on how much of that is hearsay, same as with the idea that Joss increased the shark hunting to the point of making sharks an endangered species, it is true that there was both a hike on shark hunting in 1975 and that beach attendance was reduced. While it's false that Peter Bentley ever felt guilty for the deaths of sharks caused by Joss, in fact, he never thought the movie and book were directly the cause of the hunting, he did become a shark conservation advocate later in life, even getting an award named after him to all his work. He is also quoted as saying that, had he known the truth about shark behavior back in 1971, he would have never written just the way he did. Because that's a real issue here and why I call this movie problematic. While we know that the so-called Joss effect, the overhunting caused by people seeing the movie more as a documentary than a fictional story, is not quite as extreme as some may believe, we can't deny that there was reduced beach attendance in 1975. Of course, coincidence doesn't mean casualty, but it is one weird coincidence. And a lot of shark conservation groups have quoted the film much more than, say, the Meg or other shark attack movies as being one of the reasons why it's hard to convince the general public that sharks should be protected. In the same way that other animal attack movies played the blame on animals defending their habitat rather than in the men invading it. Now, even Spielberg agrees that much of the credit goes to Berna Fields, the editor of the movie, who agreed with Spielberg that the shark prop didn't look very realistic and thus fought very hard to keep as many shots of the shark, some of which had taken hours or a full day to film, out of the final movie despite Spielberg's protest of some of those choices. So here I am going to talk about one of the best examples in the whole film that pretty much showcases why the thing that you can see is the scariest thing a good horror story can bring to the table, the second shark attack, and the very first one in broad daylight. At this point, we, the audience, know that there is a shark on the beach. Brody also knows this, even if he has no tangible proof, so the beaches are completely open. Still, it's not yet the big 4th of July weekend, so it's mostly locals at the beach. Literally no one there except for the sheriff and the mayor knew that there was a dead woman found on the beach, nor that Brody wanted to close the beaches. So everyone is having a great day, and that's what we see. The crowd playing, a man with his dog near the shoreline, and a ton of kids in the water. We see Alex ask for a bit more time in the beach, and his mother letting him just 10 more minutes, before the camera pans to Brody, who is watching the beach with an eagle eye. 
then the dog, then Alex enter the ocean and we see the doggy and even more people. And Brody keeps watching. He sees a fat woman submerging in the water and something that looks like a fin going towards her. But it happens to be an elderly man with a swimming cap on. Then the major comes and obscures his view. So we only see the major's face in half of the screen in a very clear close-up and half of the beach as a woman suddenly starts screaming. But then, as the camera finally focuses on her and Brody gets up, we see it's just that a friend grabbed her and is playing a prank. More kids get into the water and we see Alex still paddling and the other man, Harry, comes in to talk to Brody. But we still don't see any danger and everyone is trying to get him to calm down and relax. And then we see the dog owner calling for his dog as the dog has disappeared. We only see the stick that he was chasing. And finally, the theme song starts playing as we see an underwater shot of Alex in his raft. The camera starts getting closer to his legs and then we hear him scream as a geyser of blood starts coming up. Brody yells and everyone gets out of the water, parents hurrying to save their children. Everyone gets out of the water. Everyone except Alex who is being called by his distraught mother as the raft, destroyed by the teeth of the shark, floats to the shore. We never actually see the shark. We never see it beat Alex. But we know what happened, and our imaginations do the rest. And that is where the real magic of Jaws takes place. As always, with a classic movie that is good, I recommend you to watch it. It's a great movie with some amazing acting from every one of the leads. And despite the fact that Jess, Bruce the Shark, does look a bit fake, he's holding up a lot better than some CGI shark in Gored movies. If you are a horror fan, you owe it to yourself to see this masterclass of building suspense through editing and music. And again, as always, once you do, I will love to hear what you have to say about it in the comments of this video. I want to thank my dear patrons, Mitch Hyman, Elaine Ho, and Jessic, as well as my first supporter, Tanya Pineda, and the most amazing Amy Sung, without whom none of my videos would be possible. I also want to remind you that if you want to support these and my other projects and get your name mentioned here, you can do so at patreon.com slash Adalisa, with a link in the description as I know my name can be hard to spell. And with just one US dollar a month, you will always be thanked in my videos, as well as get access to a ton of art before anyone else, and get the chance to suggest future subjects for videos. If you can support me this way, I also accept likes, subscriptions to the channel, comments so that the algorithm catches engagement, and of course, you sharing the links. I will also welcome all your questions, feedbacks, and suggestions in the comments below. By the way, I promised this in my Facebook when I was writing the script, as always, Hey Hey, my little kitty, was watching the movie with me. And at some point, when Bruce came up on the screen, she tried to pet him, my poor little kitty. She also disliked Quint all the time and kept hissing at him. So um, I didn't let her watch the ending of the movie, just to let her have a happy ending. Anyway, this was Aralisa Sarate. And remember, there is not a problem in the horror genre that cannot be solved with more chainsaws.